Okay, sometimes you're not going to be able to tell everything you want to know about the animal getting in to your home just by checking the attic or your crawl space or sometimes you're going to need to get out a ladder and get up and around the soffits check uh, check where your gutters are attached and make sure there's nothing uh, obvious there so I'm going to give you a quick look at what a soffit looks like and why this is a great place for animals to access your attic okay the first thing I want to point out is the components obviously everybody knows what the gutter is the other component that's important to understand and know is this piece board, this board right here that the gutter attaches to that's called a fascia board and then this entire area underneath this is a soffit vent and then this uh, vent is attached to what's called the soffit so these are all com components uh, at the eve of your house that are important to understand let's go ahead and take a look at one more thing here okay the fascia board which is attached to the gutter generally comes in contact with ideally with the uh, roof line and you can see here there's a tiny gap that's maybe I don't know maybe about a half an inch and that's actually pretty tight compared to some places uh, on a house I'm gonna look around a little bit more and see if I can find some other areas that might be a little bit more revealing okay here's another place where the soffit and the roof line don't meet and just uh, just to give you an idea here I can actually fit my hand pretty much into this space. If you can fit your hand in there, a squirrel, a rat, a flying squirrel, any one of those animals can easily gain access to this area. And here's a worst case scenario. This is where not only has the animal got access to the roof, but they've actually started tearing away the roof itself and the shingles that were protecting this uh, roof. So now instead of the water, running into the gutter as it should it's actually dropping down into the soffit and eventually will decay that soffit out but this is actually an excellent access point for something uh, as big as a raccoon you can see I basically put my fist through there so that's a, a very uh, good indicator that something larger and even down there it's even wider uh, there's no question in my mind that uh, a raccoon could get in there and even if uh, it wasn't able to get in that hole on the top if you look under there, you can see the soffit vent is almost completely removed. It's just barely hanging. And there's a huge opening there. That's got to be six inches to eight inches wide. This could happen on a, a roof line that might be 30, 40 feet up. And it could be months to even a year before some owners, some homeowners would even have uh, you know, a notion that there was a problem. Uh, maybe the first indication would be noises in a bedroom or something like that. If it was in a room that wasn't used commonly uh, or often, then uh, something like this could go un undetected for some time. And really, this, uh, this soffit area, it deteriorated over a long period of time. The shingles were probably missing for a long time prior to that. And if it's uh, w real high, you just may not notice it. So uh, this kind of thing happens over time. Although there are many areas on this house where a rodent or a raccoon could easily climb up, this tree that's uh, basically bridging right over the top of the chimney is an excellent access point. And really the homeowner is just inviting problems. You can actually see uh, there's also some damage uh, to the trim boards from a combination of woodpeckers and probably carpenter bees and uh, this has that old uh, type of uh, masonite siding that tends to rot if it gets moldy or isn't painted frequently enough so definitely maintenance issues can create rodent problems and uh, letting them go for too long is just inviting the animal into your home okay let's do a quick rundown on noises in the attic the actual description of the sound itself is not going to be the best way to identify the animal when you hear the sound the time of day you hear the sound is going to be much more important in narrowing down the type of animal that you're dealing with. Many animals are nocturnal, but gray squirrels pretty much run on the same schedule we do. So they're going to be out playing during the day, collecting food, uh, you know, climbing on the roof, climbing up trees. You're going to see them out in the yard pretty much all day long. They generally get active early in the morning, probably six, seven, eight is when you'd hear most of the noise. 
and then again late in the evening, 7, 8, 9, even 10 o'clock at night. So they're not nocturnal. They pretty much run on the same schedule that we do. And that's when you're going to hear the noise the most. Doesn't mean they'll never make a noise in the middle of the night. Generally speaking, uh, they're not going to be real active. Uh, that doesn't mean they won't move around if they're, you know, tossing and turning just like we do. But generally speaking, they're not going to be active throughout the night. Uh, roof rats, flying squirrels, uh, they're going to be very active at night. Possibly, like we had mentioned earlier, the raccoons or possums, they're both nocturnal animals. They're going to be active at night. So what is the most important thing? A physical inspection of the area. Actually getting up into the area where you're hearing the noise and looking for those identifying factors. Again, if you're seeing droppings everywhere, it's very simple. You got roof rats. If you're not seeing droppings anywhere and you've been hearing the noises at say six, seven, eight in the morning, seven, eight, nine, ten o'clock at night, probably going to be gray squirrels. If you're finding you know, maybe two to three, maybe at the most six feet away from where you're hearing the noises, you're finding one pile of droppings, just one location. There's a very good chance that what you're dealing with is flying squirrels. Obviously, if uh, like we showed earlier in the video, you find very large droppings, it's probably going to be either a raccoon or possibly even a possum. It's not really important to distinguish between those two because the size trap that you'd use for either one of those would be pretty much the same. Now with the flying squirrels, gray squirrels, rats, you know, you can put a rat trap anywhere in the attic and you're going to catch rats. Flying squirrels, it's going to be imperative that you get the trap within two to three feet of where they're active because they're not going to use much of the attic space. So it's important that you get the trap really close. Now with flying squirrels, it's not uncommon to have more than one colony in the attic at the time. So Sometimes you'll see activity in more than one location, but actually that's more than one colony of flying squirrels. Um, some other thoughts, gray squirrels are probably the hardest to catch in an attic, so it's going to be important that when you set up your traps for gray squirrels, look for places where they're active outside. Maybe you have a bird feeder, maybe they're climbing a specific tree, maybe they're playing on your deck a lot. Those are going to be great places to place your trap. But in an attic, again, you've got an animal that's like us. They don't see well in the dark. They're not real active. They're not moving around a lot in an attic. So setting the trap in the attic is going to be one of the harder locations to set a trap. Now, if you've been trapping for a long time, you're a professional trapper, there are exceptions to these rules. A lot of trappers will put the trap specifically in the attic because, uh, or they'll put it right on the roof line where the, the squirrels are active specifically because a lot of them charge by the animal and they don't want the homeowner going up there and messing with their traps uh, or, or removing the animals and reducing their income. So one other thing I wanted to mention, of all the different possibilities of animals that could be in your attic, probably the least likely thing you're going to have in your attic is mice. House mice tend to stay on the first floor, occasionally you find them on the second floor, but climbing on the outside of the house, getting into an attic, that's really out of a mouse's character. So. When you're trying to trap for something in the attic, the last thing you want to do, especially if you're dealing with roof rats, is to put out mice traps. Mice traps are going to kill your ability to really get a hold of the animal that's causing the problem. Occasionally with a mouse trap, you might catch a young roof rat, but don't make the mistake of believing that what you're dealing with is mice, because I would say that less than 1% of the time, in my experience, has it ever been a house mouse in your attic. I guess that's pretty much all I need to cover on this video. Just want to thank you again for watching this how-to video from Bugspray.com.